We live in the most technologically connected time in history. Yet I feel like we live a more isolated life than ever. As humans, we crave connectedness. But our culture seems to be headed in the opposite direction. You walk into any restaurant and you see people sitting at tables, families, spending more time connected to their digital devices than connected to each other. I believe we're living in a disconnected, connected world. I'd like to start this conversation by reading a poem by a woman who's like many in this room. She had an opportunity to go to Africa. She spent a day with 20 students. They were sponsored by the organization that brought her there. And all these students looked at her and the other volunteers as if they were the heroes. But that's not what she thought. This is her poem. Northern Uganda. Gulu, a place of little money but love that runs through the burnt orange muddy streets. Boda bodas that swipe by you on the wrong side of the road. No, that's me on the wrong side of the road, coming from a place where the values are upside down and twisted. Uganda, a world of we. We children who have lost our parents to the war. We children who are responsible for our siblings to clothe and educate them. We children who long for food in our bellies, clothes on our back and a roof over our heads. The US spells us, but is a land of I. I want, I need, I deserve. I don't care about what's happening around the world. It's all about me. Only I matter. Uganda, land of strength, where mothers carry jerry cans of water on their heads so their families will have water. Children walk barefoot long distances for an education that we take for granted. Beautiful faces that radiate warmth, trust, friendship, and hope. A promise for the future and smiles that light up the world. We Americans thank you for showing us what you have here. The woman that wrote that also happens to be my beautiful wife, Elise. We went to Africa with you touch. You heard from Deb earlier tonight. We went for two reasons. First was to bring technology to rural villages in northern Uganda to help connect the disconnected. And the second was to teach our two children some amazing life lessons. But at the end of the day, I think we learned the most valuable lesson of all. What we found on our journey was joy. Not just any type of joy, but the type of joy that comes from a deep connectedness. Not like connecting with your Facebook friends or talking to your friend about your favorite sports team or your favorite music, but a connectedness that comes from being part of something greater than yourself. Our friends in Uganda were not only connected to each other, they were connected to the land. They were connected to past generations. They were connected by a sense of shared common purpose. Tonight, I'm here to talk to you about something that I've found that I believe will bring you more joy. Connectedness. Connectedness based on a shared common purpose. It is my hope that by sharing my story, that it might unlock more joy in your life and that you would share it with others. I'm a connector. I was put on this planet to connect with other people. I've searched in my brain over the last few weeks to try and find times in my life when I felt that same connectedness I did when I was in Uganda. I felt it right after 9-11 living in New York City. I felt it sitting on my couch watching the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Sandy, watching total strangers connect over the basic human need of survival. How did you feel after 9-11? I know that I felt connected, but it was temporary. What if I told you that you could tap into that connectedness all the time? Because I know you can. It starts by being part of something greater than yourself, by living a life based on purpose, and connecting with other human beings on a purpose level, not a surface level. And when I talk about purpose, I'm talking about your specific reason for being on this planet. My mom always said that most people go to their grave without ever singing their song, because they didn't even know they were supposed to sing. So what is your purpose? Why are you here? I've come to the conclusion that I don't think it matters what your purpose is. And I think at different times in your life, your purpose will be different. 
What matters is it touches your soul deeply. At this point in my life, my purpose is to be a connector of connectors, to bring together people that are trying to change the world. I do this in two ways. First of all, I'm a mentor to social entrepreneurs and nonprofit leaders who have the commitment and fortitude to make a difference in this world, that are using technology to connect the disconnected, and those that are using capitalism and traditional business models to make the world a better place. Second thing I'm doing is working with my wife to teach our two children to live a life based on purpose and to find their joy. Now, if your purpose aligns with mine and you're a connector, I'd love to talk to you. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here to talk about your purpose. Why are you here? You might be wondering, what are the things that happened in my life that have brought me this clarity? 30 hours after leaving Nairobi, standing in Terminal 8 at JFK Airport, I had an epiphany. For my entire life, I'd been chasing success. Ever since I was a little kid, I was told to be successful, to do your best, to work hard, and you'll get what you want. But in that moment, I realized I was running in the wrong direction. I'd been chasing success my entire life, but in that moment, I realized that I needed purpose. I needed to feel like I was part of something greater than myself. I wanted success, but I needed significance. About four years ago, I was having a conversation with some friends, and I asked our son Noah, who was eight at the time, I said, Noah, what do you need? And Noah said, I need food, water, and shelter. And I said, what's everything else? He said, everything else is a want. And I said to my friend, my son now has a chance for happiness in life. He knows the difference between a want and a need. So you think about wants and needs, and I've had this conversation with lots of people over the last four years, the difference between a want and a need in our lives. We came up with seven basic needs that we have as human beings until about two months ago. I had a conversation with a very wise friend who said you're missing a basic need. He said the need you're missing is the need to be, feel like we're part of something greater than ourselves. Wow. That was exactly what I felt when I was in JFK Airport. What if, what if having purpose, needing to feel like we're part of something greater than ourselves, is just as important as food, water, and shelter? How would that change your life? How would your life be different if you woke up every morning knowing that purpose was just as important as the roof over your head? Now, you might be saying this sounds a lot like Abraham Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. But what if Maslow missed something? In the 1990s, the Food and Drug Administration created the Food Pyramid. At the base of the pyramid were breads and cereals, and just above it were fruits and vegetables. Over the last few years, they redesigned the Food Pyramid into a plate, where now fruits and vegetables are more than half of the plate. What if Maslow's hierarchy of needs needs to change? What if we need to flip it upside down? Or maybe, just maybe, purpose is the plate that the other basic needs sit on. So, if this is the truth, what are the obstacles that get in our way? The first thing that gets in our way is we don't know what we need. If purpose is just as important as food, water, and shelter, then why don't we seek it? And to fill that void, I think as a culture, we shop. We try and buy stuff and fill that void with things. And I promise you, that's not where joy lives. Second thing that gets in our way is our own self-talk. We are meaning-making machines. We create meaning out of everything. When you turn a want into a need, which we do every day, I need a new job, I need a nicer car, I need a nicer house, I need a skinnier nose. I need, I need, I need. When you turn a want into a need, your happiness depends upon it. What are the things you think you need that determine your happiness? Another piece of self-taught that gets in our way is that life is not fair. When we're in Uganda, we spent a week with a gentleman named Robert Okello. Robert's 24 years old. He lives in a mud hut with a thatched roof. He's battled malaria and typhoid multiple times and he lived through a 20-year war. Life has not been fair to Robert. Our daughter Drew sold all of her American girl dolls before we went to Africa. 
so that she could have money to spend on our trip on the last day that we were in Uganda, in Gulu. She bought Robert a backpack and a jacket with that money. She learned the power of giving at the age of 12. But when we got back to San Diego, our children still ask for things. Daddy, I need a new iPhone, or I need an Xbox, or I need new sneakers. OK, they do need new sneakers. Their feet grow really fast. But every time I talk to them and they ask for something and I say no, they say, Daddy, that's not fair. And I'd say, you're right, life's not fair. Is life fair for Robert in Uganda? And then our daughter Drew would turn to me and say, but Daddy, I live in San Diego. This is my reality. So my daughter is basing her happiness on needing a new iPhone. What's your self-talk? What do you tell yourself you need in order to be happy, in order to find your purpose? The last thing that gets in our way is fear. Dennis Whaley defines fear as false events appearing real. 94% of all fears will never happen. So why worry about it anyway? In my 20s, I understood that intellectually. Really good. But it wasn't until a little bit later in my life that I actually came face to face with fear and understood what he was really talking about. It was 8.34 in the morning. Phone rang. My wife picked up the phone. Said, turn on the TV. Someone had flown a plane into the Twin Towers. What was she talking about, a plane, towers? Turn on the TV. For the next 12 hours, I was glued to my chair. Another plane hits. Buildings go to hell. My wife was pregnant with our second child. What type of world were we bringing him into? We were about to buy an apartment we couldn't afford. My clients had to get on airplanes to go to meetings. All the airports were closed. What was going to happen? About two days later, I got on my bicycle. I rode around Manhattan. And I ended up on 125th Street in the Hudson River, standing in front of Fairway, looking down at the towers and the smoke billowing. What was going to happen to our life? For the next four to five weeks, it was real. I talked to lots of people about what was going to happen. At the end of the day, I came to the conclusion that we'd be fine. The worst thing that happens, I came to the worst case and said the worst thing that happens is my business dies. We lose our apartment that we worked so hard to get. We pack up everybody in the van, move in with my in-laws or my parents. We have a roof over our heads. We have food on the table. And we have each other. And that's a lot more than I can say for 3,000 plus people that lost their lives. So I don't deal with fear anymore. I see it, but it doesn't stop me. So if you want to get on this journey, if you want to find why you're here, if it looks anything like my life, here's how it goes. You need to understand what you need, what you truly need in life. Not what you think you need, but what you actually need. Think about something that you think is indispensable, and now imagine your life without it. Might not be so bad after all these talks tonight, huh? Once you figure out what you need, you need to get clarity on who you are, who you uniquely are. Why were you put on this planet? One of the most important days for me in my life was the day that I realized I could not make anybody else happy. My mom says I don't have that much power. It's their responsibility to be happy, not mine. And once you gain that clarity, you can actually start to find your purpose. But this is where your journey starts, not where it ends. Because if shared common purpose is what you seek, which is what I think will bring you the most joy, then you need to share your purpose with everyone. Except our culture doesn't like that. Our culture would rather talk about your job or talk about your sports teams or talk about your favorite band. We don't like talking about purpose. Maybe the younger generation does, but my generation, that's too deep. That's too heavy. But the only way to find that connectedness, the more that your purpose speaks to your soul, and the more you connect with others that share that common purpose, the more you will find joy. 
So if I look back to our time in Africa and the folks that we met, they had a shared common purpose. Their shared common purpose was survival, was a basic human instinct. So everybody in that community is connected. So in a culture like ours, where for the middle class and above, survival is a given, what connects us? What connects us is shared common purpose. I told you I mentor young entrepreneurs around the world. This is Carrie Rich. Carrie was working in a healthcare organization in Northern Virginia as a senior director. She was talking to her boss one day and they started talking about how a little bit of money could change the world. So on her 26th birthday, her boss hands her a check and said, instead of me taking you to dinner, I'm gonna give you this check, see what you can do to change the world. So Carrie decides to do an email campaign to all of her friends and family. And the subject line of the email was the Global Good Fund. She tried to raise $6,000 for a number of different charities around the world, sends out an email. And a few weeks later, she raised $6,052. She was very proud of herself. And then she got an email from a gentleman she had met for a mere five minutes at a conference. And the email said, how do I donate a million dollars to the Global Good Fund? Now, Carrie thought it was a joke. So she sends back an email saying, um, if you're serious, come tomorrow with a certified check for lunch and we can discuss this. So Carrie shows up at lunch and there sat the man who requested anonymity with a certified check for a million dollars. Wow. In that moment, Carrie knew that she found her purpose, but she had a big problem. There was no Global Good Fund. <laughs> it was the subject line of an email. So she goes back to her, her office, she throws the million dollar check on her boss's desk and says, look what a little bit of money did, what are we gonna do now? Her boss says, at the office you work for me, at the Global Good Fund I work for you, I'm not gonna match that million dollars. Over the next couple of weeks, Carrie got nonprofit status and she runs a leadership development organization for social entrepreneurs and nonprofit leaders around the world. Carrie knew what the difference between a want and a need. She had clear clarity on who she was. She had purpose. She shared it with everyone, and amazing things happened. I promise you that if you understand your purpose and you share it with others, you will find joy. So, what do I want you to do now? I want you to do something, anything, to make you feel like you're part of something greater than yourself. It could be as easy as calling a friend you haven't talked to in years. If you're a parent, family game night. Volunteering for a nonprofit, write a check, do anything that makes you feel like you're part of something greater than yourself. Then I want you to write it down. I want you to write it down on a piece of paper, write it down on your mirror in the morning, wherever you're gonna do it, write it down. What are you gonna do to feel like you're part of something greater than yourself? Then I want you to tell a stranger, I, wanna, I want you to find somebody in this audience that you've never met, and I want you to tell them what you're committed to doing because you never know who they know or what might happen with that relationship. Next thing I want you to do is I want you to tell the world, if you're on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, whatever you're on, tell everybody what you're gonna do to feel like you're part of something greater than yourself. And then I want you to tell me, I put up a website at disconnectedworld.com, tell me what you're committed to do to feel like you're part of something greater than yourself. And then if you wanna go really big, really, really big, do it every day for the rest of your life. And I promise you, you'll find more joy than you ever imagined. And you might even find your purpose in this disconnected, connected world to a life well lived.